Welcome back for episode two of Disturbing Lost Media, a series where I cover not safe for life lost media, some of which is probably better off staying lost. I realised after uploading the first episode that Nexpo had already started a similar series, The Darkest Lost Media. A shout out from me is basically a drop in the ocean for him, but if you're interested in this topic, I'd highly recommend checking that out too. Chewing myself in the foot a bit here, but his production value is significantly higher than mine, so it is well worth a watch. Anyway, let's investigate. If you enjoy internet mysteries and generally disturbing content, feel free to subscribe and turn on notifications for more content like this. I also have a Patreon and a PayPal, so if you're interested in supporting the channel, feel free to check those out, links will be in the description. You can also leave me a tip by clicking the thanks under this video. Thanks to anyone who considers this. This video will contain vague discussions of topics that some might find distressing. Few discretion is advised. You can head over to my Patreon for an uncut version of this video which features a whole extra entry that wasn't suitable for this cut. This video is sponsored by The Ridge Wallet. This is the second time I'm mentioning this brand on this channel, but in case you missed the first ad, Ridge offer a variety of wallets that are made with RFID blocking technology that protects you from digital pickpocketers. They come in over 30 colours and styles and are made from durable materials that are built to last. Ridge is so confident about the sturdiness of their products that they offer a lifetime warranty and you can even return them within 45 days and get a full refund if you don't love them. They kindly sent me some products to try so I've been using one of their wallets for a few weeks now and honestly I can't speak highly enough about it. As you can see, the design I chose looks great. It's the Forged Pacific wallet in case you want to get the same one. I really like how compact it is. It holds up to 12 cards plus room for cash and it fits in my back pocket, which is a first for me. I also like that they're somewhat customizable as you can use an elastic strap or money clip to hold notes and you can get a coin tray that slots into the wallet to hold change or keys. Ridge doesn't just sell wallets, they have pens and key cases sleekly designed to hold up to six keys, preventing them from jangling in your pocket as you're walking. You can get 10% off your order by clicking the link in the description and using the code Internet Investigator. And with every dollar you spend on the website before the 30th of September, you'll be entered to win a brand new upgraded Ford Bronco or $75,000 in cash if you prefer. The winner will be announced in October. Wheel of Fortune is an American game show that has been on air since January 1975. The premise of the game show is basically Hangman. There's a screen with a number of blank spaces that will spell out a phrase and contestants spin the wheel and guess a consonant. Each letter they guess correctly shows up on the screen and they have the option to buy a vowel for $250. The wheel itself has 24 wedges, most of which are labelled with cash amounts which if landed on and the contestant guesses the right letter, they'll get that amount times however many times the letter features in the phrase. Two are labelled with bankrupt which will eliminate any cash or prizes the contestant has accumulated and there's also one loser turn wedge which is self-explanatory. There is a bit more to it but that's the game in a nutshell, the rest isn't really relevant for the purpose of this entry. An episode filmed on the 13th of February 1998 and aired on the 18th of March featured contestants named Matthew, Gishel and Noah. Gishel ended up winning the most, she got through to the bonus round and won a total of $45,156 and two holidays. Noah went home with nothing and Matthew Fenwick, who was from Kansas City, Missouri and was studying a doctorate in piano, won $4,400. Unbeknownst to the producers, at the time he appeared on the show, Matthew, who was 30 years old at the time, was on the run after being accused of having inappropriate contact with two girls aged 8 and 10 in April the previous year. An arrest warrant had been issued for him in November, but police had been unable to locate him until one of the girls saw him on TV and he was arrested two days later. 
I was thinking it was incredibly stupid of him to appear on Wheel of Fortune when he was wanted for such serious crimes, but his attorney claimed that he didn't even realise there was a warrant until he was arrested. In July, he pled guilty to two counts of aggravated indecent liberties with a child and was sentenced to six years in prison before his conditional release in 2004. As if the ordeal itself wasn't traumatic enough for the victims, one of them seeing him on TV must have made it so much harder. Thank God it's what led to his arrest, so at least it was worth it in one way. I'm not sure exactly how lost this episode of Wheel of Fortune was, I doubt it was ever shown as a rerun and it couldn't be found anywhere online for quite some time. Throughout this disturbing lost media series, I'm using the term lost media quite loosely. The definition of it depends on who you ask, it's kind of a spectrum, as some will only count media that has been destroyed and likely never will resurface, whereas others would include media that still exists, just not available to the public, etc. I usually find the backstories more interesting than the media itself, so I will be covering a wide range of media that varies in availability, including examples that have since been found, like this one. A post was made in August 2020 on the Lost Media Wiki forums that highlighted the lack of information about this episode online. In fact, there was more information about an episode of Super Password that featured a fugitive who committed insurance fraud than there was on this, and that crime is obviously much less significant, but it is also kind of interesting, so I'll give you a quick summary of that situation. Super Password was a game show where two teams competed against each other to guess a word. One person would give the other one-word clues to help them guess the password, they also knew the first letter of the word, and if they guessed enough correctly, they'd win a cash prize. 36-year-old Kerry Ketchum was a former deputy sheriff who appeared on the show using a fake name in December 1987 and won $56,000, making him the biggest winner in the show's history at the time. When he went to collect his prize the following month, he was arrested and later sentenced to five years in prison after staging an elaborate hoax in which he faked his wife's death to claim $100,000 on an insurance policy. Unbeknownst to his wife, after he had separated from her, he told the fireman's fund, American Life Insurance Company, that she had died in a car accident. This was not his first conviction, as he'd spent 18 months in prison when he'd been found guilty of stealing around $200,000 worth of military equipment while working in the Air Force, leading to the termination of his position in the Montgomery County Sheriff's Department in Ohio. In addition to the life insurance scam, he was also accused of fraudulently obtaining a $15,000 bank loan and writing $15,000 worth of bad checks, alongside other criminal charges in Alaska. Similar to the case of Matthew Fenwick, a viewer of Super Password had recognised Kerry and contacted police, leading to his arrest. In October 2020, the full episode of Wheel of Fortune that featured Matthew was uploaded on Dailymotion and shared on the By a Vowel boards where users had previously discussed it, at the time believing it was lost. Back in the early days of YouTube, when Fred was everyone's guilty pleasure and I was making cringy Club Penguin music videos, not everyone was uploading such light-hearted content. Anthony Powell, channel name Tony48219, was a Christian man who, inspired by fellow creator Venom Fang X, began posting videos in 2007 to promote his religious beliefs. He became a relatively well-known character in YouTube's religious discussion and debate circles for his hostile rants about various topics including evolution, with atheists, who he compared to monkeys, flies, worms and dogs, and black women often being the target of his anger, even though he was black himself. He claimed that black women were promiscuous and accused them of killing thousands of babies a day by having abortions. He resented his assertion that they didn't seem to be attracted to him and instead went for deadbeat men instead, and titled a rant video about this, Black Women Don't Deserve Respect. His internalised racism was not just limited to women, as he called black men worthless, but overall blamed women for going for these types of men and enabling them to continue to be no good men, as he called them. While black women were the most unfairly targeted, he was misogynistic in general and believed that women should be obedient, submissive and subservient to their husbands. 
The feedback he received as a result of these videos was mixed, with some agreeing with and praising his opinions, and others, rightfully so, opposing the extreme views he promoted. Both types of reactions likely egged him on, and he continued on a downward spiral that would end in tragedy. Tony48219 wasn't his only channel during the time he was active. He went through an ongoing cycle of his channel being suspended due to his controversial content, so he'd just keep creating more and uploading more videos against atheists and women. From the videos that have been archived, it doesn't appear that Tony was able to form logical arguments to prove his points. Of course, when it came to his rants against black women, there is no logic that could justify his stance. It seemed to stem from a deep-rooted incel mentality. As for his anti-atheist rants, he seemed to revert to calling atheists stupid and evil without actually explaining why he believed they were wrong. If we were to compare him to, say, Ben Shapiro, who I strongly dislike and disagree with on many points, by the way, there's a stark difference in the way they construct their rants. Ben at least tries to back up his points with facts and logic, TM, and manages to keep his composure when debating, so to the untrained ear, he may come across as somewhat of an intellectual, even though he's often extremely misguided and blatantly incorrect. Tony, on the other hand, seemed to lack self-control, allowed his emotions, usually anger, to get the better of him, and was generally cocksure enough to believe that he didn't need to provide any evidence, using his personal experiences and subjective view of the world to substantiate his erroneous views. Tony would tell his subscribers to harass atheist YouTubers, and often harass them himself too, even if they didn't involve themselves in the religious debates. One of these was 20-year-old Asia McGowan, an aspiring dancer and actress who happened to attend the same community college as Turner. As an atheist and a black woman who was an advocate for women's rights, she was the epitome of everything Tony thought was wrong with the world. He would attack her in the comments of her videos using multiple different accounts, though she wasn't aware the comments were all coming from the same person. On the 6th of April 2009, Asia uploaded a video addressed to her haters, or hater, in which she stated that hating on someone only brings them up and you down, and told them to find something better to do than writing stupid messages on her videos. Tony already held an irrational amount of hate towards Asia, and this video likely magnified that. Sadly, it would be Asia's final upload. Shortly after, Tony uploaded a video in which he spoke of his intention to end his own life, quote, There's absolutely nothing for me to do in this life. I don't have no purpose. There's no point. There's no point to me living anymore. I really am thinking about killing myself, and I'm pretty much gonna do it, and I'm so scared. Although a number of people saw this video before ideation became a reality, for one reason or another, sufficient action to prevent him harming himself or anyone else was not taken. At least one of his viewers claimed to have contacted the police, but they didn't contact Tony or perform a wellness check. On the 13th of April, Tony went into college and made his way towards a classroom looking for Asia. What happened next was witnessed by 12-year-old Christian Plonker, who heard a gunshot and bravely went to investigate. When he heard a scream, he at first didn't know if there was cause for concern, as shouting and screaming wasn't an uncommon occurrence in a theatre class where students were often rehearsing. After the gunshot, through glass doors, he then saw Asia running and screaming, attempting to flee from Turner, who was armed with a shotgun. Tony dragged her back into the classroom, and Christian heard another gunshot, which fatally wounded Asia. Police were called, and as they arrived, they heard a final gunshot. This time, Tony had shot himself, and he died almost instantly. Tony's parents were interviewed shortly after the incident, and they apologised to Asia's family, stating that they knew he had suffered with depression for quite some time, and while they worried he might take his own life, they never thought he'd harm anyone else. They claimed to have tried to get him help over the years, but there wasn't enough support available, and he didn't like taking medication. His online persona was apparently a far cry from his demeanour in person, as he was described as shy and a sweetheart, and it was a total shock to his parents when they found out what he did. Some people blamed Venom Fang X for the incident, one of the more well-known creators in the religious YouTube community who Tony idolised. 
He made a video in response in which he described it as a tragedy, expressed sympathy for both families and said, quote, God loves you, God loved Tony, and God loved the young lady who was killed. Had I the ability to speak to Tony today, or if I was able to speak to him before he had done this, I most certainly would have told him that suicide and murder is not the answer. This is a tragedy, and anyone who thinks otherwise is sick, absolutely sick, and anyone who blames anyone other than Tony for Tony's action is wrong. Sometime after the incident, the channels Tony was using at the time, the legend Tony 48075 and Tony 48219 is legendary, were suspended, rendering the majority of his videos lost. You can still find a few full videos online, as well as some shorter clips, and they, in my opinion, provide most of the context needed to understand the situation. Asia's channel was also terminated after it was somehow hacked in September 2021 and renamed to Ripple Global, and I wasn't able to find any full videos, but if anyone else can, please let me know in the comments. Evelyn Wow, born in October 1903, was an English writer, journalist, and book reviewer best known for his satires, Decline and Fall, A Handful of Dust, and his World War II trilogy, Sword of Honor. Evelyn lived a relatively eventful life, attending Lansing College, then Hartford College in Oxford, however he failed to obtain a degree due to poor results that led to the loss of his scholarship. Evelyn had struggled with his mental health during university and wrote to a friend saying, I have been living very intensely these last three weeks. For the last fortnight, I have been nearly insane. I may perhaps one day in a later time tell you some of the things that have happened. He then started a course at Heatherley's, but this was short-lived as he was bored with the routine, so abandoned the course. After spending weeks partying in London, then running out of money, he started a teaching job in North Wales, where he felt isolated and as a result decided to resign. He took on a couple more teaching jobs in the next few years and eventually published a short story, The Balance, while working on other things, including a comic novel and a biography. In 1927, he got engaged to a woman named Evelyn and they became known as He Evelyn and She Evelyn to their friends. His first significant success was when his novel, Decline and Fall, was published in September 1928, and after this he was commissioned to write travel articles in return for a free Mediterranean cruise, which he and she, Evelyn, went on as a delayed honeymoon. They had to cut the trip short when she developed pneumonia, and around a month after she recovered, she suddenly confessed that she had an affair with their mutual friend, eventually leading to their divorce in 1929. Evelyn spent around eight years staying with various friends, and during this time, he wrote another novel and was hired to write various articles. His satire, Vile Bodies, was his first major commercial success, described as a dark, bitter manifesto of disillusionment, and it propelled his journalism career, allowing him to earn larger fees for his articles. In 1930, he converted to Catholicism and began travelling extensively for the next few years as he continued to write articles for various journals and newspapers. In 1937, he married She Evelyn's 17-year-old cousin and eventually had seven children with her, one of whom sadly died in infancy. A couple of years later, he found employment in the Royal Marines, during which time his writing took a backseat as his training left him with so stiff a spine that he found it painful even to pick up a pen. After a parachuting accident left him with a fractured fibula, he applied for three months unpaid leave to write his novel, Brideshead Revisited, and this was extended until June 1944. He returned to duty, but while flying to Yugoslavia to begin a mission, the plane crash landed and he was injured, delaying the mission for a month. He was later released by the army and published Brideshead Revisited in May 1945, which was a huge success, bringing him fame, fortune, and literary status. He wrote various other books over the years, and by the time he was 50, he was described as old for his years, selectively deaf, rheumatic, irascible, and became increasingly dependent on alcohol and drugs to self-medicate his insomnia and depression. 
His popularity began decreasing and work was drying up as his health slowly deteriorated, leading to his doctors recommending a change of scenery. Evelyn boarded a ship to Sri Lanka, but sent a letter to Laura, in which he said that he was hearing voices and that other passengers were whispering about him, and so he left the ship when it arrived in Egypt and flew to Colombo, but wrote to Laura saying that the voices followed him. Laura spoke to her friend, whose husband agreed to fly out to Evelyn and bring him home, but he decided to make his own way back. At this point, his psychosis progressing to a point where he believed he was possessed by the devil. When he returned, he was checked out by a doctor, who found that he was suffering from bromide poisoning as a result of the medication he'd been taking, and the hallucinations quickly stopped when he was given different medication. Evelyn continued to write articles and a couple more books that sold many copies, though he was somewhat of a big spender, so his profits never lasted that long. In 1960, he was offered the honour of a CBE, but turned it down because he believed he should have been given the status of a knighthood instead. As a way of avoiding taxes, he set up a trust fund for his children, though this eventually came back to bite him, as there was a flaw in the terms and a large sum of back tax had to be paid, so he signed various contracts to write several books. These were eventually cancelled, as his deteriorating health prevented him from working on the projects, he described himself as toothless, deaf, melancholic, shaky on my pins, unable to eat, full of dope, quite idle, and also said that all fates were worse than death. The following year, on the 10th of April 1966, at the age of 62, he died of heart failure, leaving behind a mixed legacy in the form of various novels, biographies, autobiographies and articles he'd written. Some had been received significantly better than others. So now you have a brief summary of Evelyn's life story, but what has any of this got to do with lost media? The media itself that we're about to discuss isn't particularly disturbing in itself, though the story surrounding it is quite dark. In July 1924, at the age of 20, Evelyn began writing his first novel titled The Temple at Thatch, which he described as a little book that was going to be all about magic and madness, centering around an undergraduate who inherited the remains of a country house and decided to move into it so they could practice black magic there. He initially believed the plot was quite good, but by September, doubts began to creep into his mind, and he stated that it was at risk of becoming dull, causing him to wonder if he would ever end up finishing it. After reading a novel called A Cypress Grove by William Drummond, he temporarily became inspired to continue writing on his own novel and considered renaming it to The Fabulous Paladins after a passage in A Cypress Grove. His motivation would come and go, but around a year after he started writing it, he considered it to be rather good, and decided to send the draft to his friend, Harold Acton. Evelyn didn't exactly receive the feedback he was hoping for, with Harold describing what he had read as, quote, "...polite but chilling, too English for my exotic taste, too much nid-nodding over port." Nevertheless, he suggested that Evelyn make copies to send to his close friends. Evelyn didn't exactly take the criticism well, and rather than attempt to improve what he'd already written, he lost all faith in it and decided to burn the only copy of the manuscript. A combination of this perceived failure and a job opportunity falling through around the same time sent Evelyn into a deep depression. As previously mentioned, he had already experienced some problems with his mental health that continued on and off throughout his entire life. At this point, his depression plunged him to a point lower than he'd ever experienced before though, and he wrote in his diary, The phrase, the end of the tether, besets me with unshakable persistence. He believed his only option now was to take his own life, and so he went down to the beach one night, undressed himself, and swam out into the ocean with the intention of drowning himself. I think drowning would be quite a nasty way to go, but I wonder if the method was somewhat symbolic for Evelyn, perhaps feeling as though he was already metaphorically drowning in his own failures. The note that he left also included a quote from the Greek tragedian Euripides on how the sea washes away all ills, so it certainly seems like drowning was significant for him. While swimming, he happened to get stung by a jellyfish, and bizarrely, this seemed to snap him out of it, and he swam back to the shore. 
While Evelyn certainly experienced many ups and downs in his life, had his attempt at ending his life been successful, he would have died with almost no one knowing his name, no legacy, he never would have had children, and he never would have gone on to have all the achievements that he's now remembered for. Considering Evelyn burned the only manuscript that existed of the temple at Thatch, no one alive today has ever read it, and no one ever will, unless it turned out that he had actually made a copy that is yet to be found, though that's highly unlikely due to his reasons for destroying it in the first place. He revealed some information about the novel in his autobiography, and other details have been disclosed in biographies written about him. A short story he published later in 1925 titled The Balance makes a few occasional references to the temple at Thatch, and some parallels can be drawn in the plots, including that both take place in Oxford and both were formatted like a film script, with the possible intention of them being made into films. I'd be interested to hear your thoughts in the comments, plus any other examples of not safe for life lost media you'd like me to cover in the future. If you enjoyed the video, please consider liking and subscribing, and leaving a tip by clicking the thanks under this video. Thanks again to The Ridge Wallet for sponsoring this video. Remember to click the link in the description and use the code Internet Investigator for 10% off your order. Huge thank you to my patrons, whose names are on screen now, I really appreciate your support. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next Thursday in a new video.